I really hope you don't have a golden calf because if you do, it's probably the Department of Defense and I am going to go at it hard today. Hi, my name is Hody Johns and you're listening to the Weird Libertarians Daily Podcast and this week I have the Department of Defense in my sights. So if you heard about a guy who wanted to disestablish, decentralize the military, let it go back out to the states, uh, let individual communities decide how they would defend themselves, uh, you would probably think, oh, maybe he was some pre-nuclear war you know, didn't understand the basics of battle. You must be quoting somebody from the 1600s. But no, it's not that at all. And uh, maybe you're thinking, oh, you know, if he said, if he called for uh, an alerted, knowledgeable citizenry to take care of the defense instead of a large industrial military complex, because a military complex gains, quote, unwarranted, unwarranted influence that endangers our liberties and domestic processes, unquote, you're probably thinking, oh, you're referencing some anarchist, that's got to be some Lysander Spooner, some, something crazy like that. Uh, no, that is Dwight D. Eisenhower, legendary American general and president of the United States. Now, you might say, well, for some reason, I don't remember him disbanding the Department of Defense if he wanted it shredded apart really, really badly. Well, he actually tried, and Congress stopped him. Uh, They said you could not have a Federal Reserve of less than 700,000 people because that was their jobs on the line. Coincidentally, Dwight D. Eisenhower was the last president to balance the budget because he cared. Now, I know we're going all the way back to the 50s on that, but that's where it takes place. That's the last time America's actually balanced the the budget. Look at our record since then, since the 50s. Now, it takes small, you know, it takes these sacrifices, but nobody understood this more than Dwight D. Eisenhower. In fact, not only did he recognize that this wasn't really a sacrifice, but it was actually a gain that we would actually be safer Even in a post-nuclear war era, we would be safer by defending ourselves, by having an armed citizenry, by having multiple militias. Well, where did he get that idea from? Well, maybe World War I and II, when he fought in those and recognized that the best militaries that he fought against weren't actually state-sponsored. They were personal. They were funded privately, and they were developed, and and they were, were strong and difficult to combat against. On top of that, multiple generals uh, in World War II, one taking the Japanese islands out in the, out in the West, and then another one in Europe in the East. Uh, you had Patton, uh, you had Eisenhower, you had uh, MacArthur. You had a bunch of different generals. Now, we say in this modern era, well, you need one commander in chief, just one guy who can be able to be that voice. But that's not the era that it was in. You might forget. We had General George Washington found this country, right, fighting as hard as any general's ever fought, maybe the most brilliant brilliant military tactician of all time, and even he made sure there were other generals. In fact, he insisted upon it. In his farewell address, he even warned the countrymen against this newly established department that to avoid the necessity of these overgrown military establishments, which under any form of government are inauspicious to liberty and which are to be regarded as particularly hostile to Republican liberty. Of course, what would he know? What would Eisenhower know? They're only the most brilliant military tacticians in American history. And if they support downsizing the Department of Defense or even getting rid of it, Maybe we should take a look at this thing. It seems to lend some credence to it. Now, let's not forget, we won an American Revolution without a Department of War. We didn't need one. Now, the Department of War, now called the Department of Defense, but back then, it wasn't established until 1789, after we'd already won. Now, maybe you think, well, I'm sure it just would have been a lot cleaner if we'd had a single centralized power, but you'd be wrong. Remember that we were the underdogs in that war. It took the, the knowledge of each individual area. You had Horatio Mills 
in the north and you had Washington in the south. You had so many other generals that knew their area and said, okay, I can command this area. I think I know where we might collaborate and achieve some victory. Yes, you need some type of unity, but you don't need a department to do that. You're going to have that anyway. People didn't want to die to the British Empire. They understood after they invaded Concord and Lexington that New York, Virginia, these things were next. And so you didn't need to tell these generals, hey, generals, let's make sure we get all on the same page here. That's unnecessary. It wasn't necessary. We didn't have that, that political mechanism in place to make them agree and make them collaborate. Simply, they did. Why? Because of self-preservation. And really, when we talk about the Department of Defense, defense is really that self-preservation we're talking about. Let's look on a bit of the history in case that's not a convincing enough argument for you to make you understand why there are real problems with the Department of Defense. So 1789 it gets created, of course, after the war, after we don't need it anymore. And they go back and, you know, a few, a few decades later, decide to declare war on the British Empire in 1812 again. Now, it's funny when you think of the American military, you might think of the most powerful military in the world, and you probably should. But we don't win the War of 1812. We get them out of our territories, but they still have all of what we know as the United Kingdom and Britain. And we go to war with them. We lose a lot of people, but it doesn't help us at all. We're still where we are. They're still where they are. So the War of 1812, now by modern standards, the cost of the war would have been only $1.6 billion to tell you the scope of how things have increased. That's adjusted for today's dollars. It would have cost $1.6 billion. So remember that, of course, what happens with all these departments as soon as you create them, well, they tend to grow, don't they? Including spending money and American lives to go to a war that is really unnecessary. It wasn't very popular. In 1824, the US War Department created the Bureau of Indian, Indian Def Affairs. Why is that under the Department of Defense? Well, let's see here. We got the Indians. We really don't want them here. Might as well give that to the Department of Defense. Now you say, well, defense, but if they're dealing with the Indian Affairs and the Indians aren't part of our nation, that might sound like the Department of Offense which is quickly what it became. Of course, the Department of Defense executed many U.S. Indians and uh, never apologized for it. They were here in the States, some of them even citizens, which is why I called them U.S. Indians, but even the ones not in our territory, they were executed as though they had no regard for human life. Now, it, what we know about the Constitution was supposed to protect everyone affiliated with the United States. They, the founders frequently go out of their way to make sure that you know, as you read the text, they're not talking about American citizens that are naturalized or born in this country, except in very few cases. Usually those cases are running for office. Those rights are extended to everyone, not just naturalized American citizens. But that right wasn't afforded to them because, of course, this gigantic institution decided, well, we're going to have to have a whole separate... Uh, division to look after them. Now, we're going to get into this later, but what do you think became of the D Bureau of Indian Affairs? Do you think that it just went away? Because, of course, it wasn't needed anymore. After we killed them and dragged them all the way across the nation and had the Trail of Tears catastrophe, I'm sure we just got rid of them, right? <laughs> not at all. They're the modern-day Department of the Interior, believe it or not. So they go from being what we're warring against to a department that deals with, where should we set them so that they're most aesthetically pleasing? I'll rag on the Department of the Interior later, but just so you know, that's where the history comes from. Of course, we had the Civil War, uh, completely uh, set up by our Department of War, this Department of Defense, uh, which has fingers in all you know, all these states and so a whole bunch of pies and says, well, you know what would really help get people buying our guns and, you know, is if we go to war with each other. Now, this may not, this may surprise you. There, the Civil War started in 1861. 
But it was not actually a declared war until a few weeks later. In fact, Congress didn't clarify that this war was trying to restore the Union until months after it had begun. So what started that war? Well, it might not surprise you. The Department of Defense decided that Fort Sumner was just a little too heavily fortified and getting a little too dangerous. So instead of, you know, rationing it out and trying to make a treaty, they, commit, they send several military troops in to deal with them without the consent of Congress, without even the consent of the president. Just having that standing army there available at your disposable, disposal, might as well use them. So they sent them into Fort Sumner. Lincoln, of course, suspends habeas corpus. Nobody's allowed a fair trial. That's, of course, something that the Department of Defense has to do. If they're going to do their jobs effectively, you can't have your human rights. Of course, then they passed the Revenue Act of 1861, and this is where everything becomes an economic issue. And it never stops being an economic issue. In 1861, uh, we get the first income tax of all time. The income tax, as you know, never goes away. It starts out small, but in order to fund this war, of course you need a little bit of taxation. It's not enough that they taxed all of the imports. Up until that point, America had resi had persisted to exist entirely based on tariffs, on collecting imports, taking a little cut of our exports, but it wasn't something that the common man had to deal with. Then all of a sudden you make it about personal income. That's the beginning of double taxation and we have the Department of Defense to thank for that. We have the Militia Act. Uh, the Militia Act shifts the control of the National Guard uh, from the states, which, surprise, surprise, it belonged to the states for a long time. It was not this big, sprawling federal organization you knew about. That didn't start until 1903, where they said, okay, you know what, maybe, maybe we should start to give these to the federal departments instead of having the states be able to defend themselves. Now, this is a problem. You wonder why states' rights have gone downhill since then. Well, if your ability to, your, to defend yourself has shifted from your state control into your federal control, what happens to the power of your state? Well, of course it goes downhill. So because you rely on them for defense now. So then the Department of Defense decides, hey, I don't like the way you're doing this, that, or the other. What are you going to do? If you don't comply, if you're not willing to pay ball, play ball, you're going to lose that ability to defend yourself. We have a couple of world wars. Now, we're, we're, while we're on the subject of losing wars, well, it's easy to say we were on the winning side in those wars, wars Hody. We, in World War I, we won what? In World War II, we won, uh, well, we won. We put our soldiers along with the side who won, but what did we achieve? Of course, this matters. In the late 1910s, we had John Maynard Keynes, Keynesian economics. Why are we discussing economics when we're supposed to be talking about the Department of Defense? Because it's important. Keynes railed against ending the war, World War I. He said, this is going to lead to a recession. He was actually right about that. Why? Because if you end the World War, if you retreat too early, then we're not spending money on it. Those people are going to not have a job anymore. And that's a problem. We have the perpetual war state because of the economic system that he designed. Eventually, we adjust the whole economic system based on the advice of Keynes. We get that Keynesian economic system. We adjust our national income identity equation. Instead of saying, well, you're producing something of value, so therefore your currency is worth more, we change our economic equation to say, well, you're spending money, and so it must be for something good. GDP is equal to the sum of all of our spending. So we get the broken window economics. If you're spending money on it, it must be great. That's good news. You've got jobs. But if that job is cleaning up a problem that doesn't need to be a problem, then really it's just a bunch of papers telling us that our money is worth something. It's just a bunch of empty promises, empty Congresses telling us your money is worth something. This is really worth something. We've really done something. 
This continues all the way today where we have the famous boneyard in the United States. We immediately send the majority of our planes that we build, build, build for, and we're talking military fighters. We send them to the boneyard to never be flown. Right now we have more fighters than we have pilots that know how to pilot them. But we spent money on them, so it counts towards our GDP. We say our country is worth more because we spent money on it. See, Keynes had a huge issue with us getting out of the war. Now, I won't label Keynes as being a warmonger, but he simply recognized an economic truth that if you're spending money on it and then it goes away, then you're going to have less employment. That's accurate. But isn't the right thing to do to create an economy based on peacetime as opposed to wartime? Because of the Department of Defense listening to John Maynard Keynes and, and the Congress listening to them, we find ourselves in a series of perpetual wars that we didn't need to be involved in. We had to make excuses to get involved in World War I because the economy was stagnant. World War II, same thing. Heels of the Great Depression. Had a, had a whole bunch of bad economic policies. What's the quickest way to fix those? Send our troops to war. What happens after the war ends? Uh, we need to find excuses to go back to war. In 1943, or 1942, I'm sorry, we decide to intern the Japanese. 110,000 people of Japanese descent. Two-thirds of the internees were actually American citizens. None of them, not a single one of them, was ever charged with one crime. This was paranoia at its finest, is what we tell ourselves. But really, it was just ec ec economics at its worst. Because we said we had to spend money on something. You know what's a project we can do? Interning the Japanese. They seized what we thought was just paranoia, but they used that paranoia as an excuse to get involved in a military conflict with citizens, with our own people, with arresting them. Now you can say, hey, I don't think that was an armed conflict, but let me tell you this, they weren't dragged out of their homes by people who were unarmed. <laughs> and it was the Department of Defense, of course, that carried out these orders. In 1943, the world's largest office building, the Pentagon, is completed after numerous construction problems. <clears throat> As a quote from an architect, the building was built upon a foundation of lies, secrecy, and cost overruns. Unquote. It was supposed to only cost $35 million and ended up costing $75 million. Hey, some things never change, do they? 1943, we're still doing that today. We say a project will run X amount of money, it run X, runs way over that. And who's on the hook? Well, the American taxpayer, of course. Even if, the, even if they don't get the taxes together for it, they just print the money for it, which makes everyone's money worse not just the taxpayers, even those who are getting welfare money, see their, theirs go down. I mean, it, it hurts literally everyone when we go over on these projects. The Pentagon was just that trend, trendsetter, and of course that continues today. 1950, following North, invasion, the North Korea's invasion of South Korea, President Truman, experiencing an economic depression, decides to send U.S. military forces to the Korean Peninsula without a congressional declaration of war. Make no mistake, this is not something new to our era. Obama didn't coin the ability to, to call a war a kinetic military action and just basically rename it to the point where even his own Department of Defense people have no idea the difference between that and a war. We did the same thing. We did the same thing during the Civil War. And guess what? They did the same thing during the Korean War. We never officially declared a war on them. Congress didn't do it. Truman just sent them over there. Hostilities in North Korea would end one year later, or I'm sorry, three years later in 1953 with an armistice, but no formal end of the war because a war was never started. In the North Koreans' eyes, and you might see this follow up today, they're still at war with us because there was never any formal declaration of surrender. We never repaid anything. So our we surprised at all that they hate us. Now, they invaded South Korea. They should not have done that. Of course, we took South Korea's side. But the North Koreans were still upset with us for doing that, for ever getting involved. Guess what? That North Korean non-alliance has placed American lives in danger. 
instead of this Department of Defense getting involved in a foreign conflict, and like they always tell us, it's for your own good, you're safer because we got involved, it actually made us more open to hostilities. We're actually encountering a lot more problems because we decided to get involved in all these foreign entanglements. 1955, instead of being divided on a functional basis, like what happened with Eisenhower and Washington and all of the greats that knew how to win wars, where they had individual units decide for their area how we should win, they divide on a functional basis. Or I'm sorry, not divided on a functional basis, it's divided on a service basis. So the military is separate from the Navy, which is separate from the Air Force. That happened in 1955. What's the problem with that? Well, then the Army needs boats, but then also the Navy needs boats, but then also the Navy needs planes, but also the, the Air Force needs boats, and everybody needs boots. So we have, so it's a mess, and the difference between them is almost indistinguishable. Of course, I don't mean to offend anybody who was involved. I have some family involved who I'm sure would be like, no, there's a million things of difference. But the real issue is, is they're being div divided upon these arbitrary lines, which really don't make any sense. As opposed to controlling an era, like we did during successful military times before, or dividing along lines of, of tasks, they just split between, between kind of ground stuff and kind of air stuff and kind of water stuff, but also you have to do each other's jobs as well. And so none of it makes sense. And unfortunately, that dysfunction has placed American troops in danger. So when we do get in these entanglements, the American troops pay the price for our dysfunction. All of the time when we have an unsuccessful conflict or we have a friendly fire issue, the departments will fight with each other and say, you, I thought you knew we were going to go there. I thought you knew this was our, our operation. We didn't mean to trip all over each other. But of course, Congress doesn't really understand war. They only understand money and power. And they just use war as an excuse to have more money and power for themselves. Of course, this takes us all the way through Vietnam, through the Cold War, over and over. It proves that we keep going to wars for these bad reasons because we just have to keep the complex going. In 2005, Congressman Duke, uh, his real first name was Randy, Duke Cunningham, pled guilty to charges of bribery and tax evasion. How did he evade all of these taxes? Well, he was working a racket with the defense contractors for pretending to buy military stuff that they didn't actually buy. He got eight years in prison for losing trillions of dollars. Yes, that's trillions, plural. Because what's happened since 2005? Well, right before then, we had September 11, 2001. We were already aware. In fact, if you look at right before uh, the... The, the attacks the week before the terrorist attacks, Rumsfeld was actually talking about decreasing the size of our military because they'd lost a trillion dollars. Fast forward to today, what's in the news? Oh, the Department of Defense can't seem to locate a few trillion dollars because we just, I don't know, we just can't seem to find it. We, we spent it because we had to spend it because we had to justify our spending, but we forgot to fill out the lines on what we spent it on. Most of the time, they at least go to war to make an excuse for spending the money. They aren't even doing that anymore. They're just misplacing it now. The Department of Defense is dangerous. They are getting people killed, and they are making you less safe. So it's time to let go of this idea that the Department of Defense is the one sacred cap, the one thing that we shouldn't touch in government. If you don't think we need to abolish it, we definitely need to downsize it, and we definitely need to make it transparent. If our greatest military minds thought that the American people deserved to be armed, deserved to have a say in their militaries, deserved to have it be transparent, maybe we should listen to them. Because isn't defense the point of this whole thing? Again, Congress overrode Eisenhower when he said, we don't need this many troops. They said, that's too many people to have unemployed. I'm sorry. So instead of putting them into the private sector or instead of giving them to the states or the counties or to private firms to be bodyguards, to make even more money and have access to 
actual good medical care, we're going to force them to work for these really low wages for really crappy medical care. It's for the sake of our military that I say we need to get rid of it. I don't have an anger towards the military. I think that we need to have a serious look on at what they're doing in the world. And I would encourage anyone I know in the military to resign and to leave until we start doing moral things around the world. But I understand that they joined because they have a passion for defense. They have a passion for America. That's something that I want to kindle and not destroy. But the best way they can do that in this era is outside of that department. We need to eliminate the Department of Defense for the sake of defense. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Until then, keep fueling the fires of liberty.